Hello, I'm Andy Van Clunen, CEO of National Skills Coalition, and I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to our 2022 Skills Summit. Now, our last Skills Summit was here in Washington, D.C. in February 2020. It was just like many other summits that we've done. We caught up with our friends and colleagues from across the country. We exchanged handshakes and hugs. We broke bread together. We went up to the hill sitting side by side with our members of Congress. Um, we had no idea back in February 2020 how differently things were going to be weeks after that summit. And we had hoped this year that we were gonna have you here in Washington with us for this year's Skills Summit to kind of get back to that in-person coalition camaraderie that fuels so many of us over the course of the year as we're fighting for workers and small businesses throughout our country. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to wait another year before we can safely get you all together again. But I'm thrilled that we have thousands of you registered for this year's Skills Summit, uh, more than we've ever had. So I'm hoping that many of you are gonna be back with us in person in Washington next year. This year, we have an incredible list of policymakers joining us, including Ambassador Susan Rice, who leads the White House Domestic Policy Council, three US cabinet secretaries from the Departments of Labor, Commerce, and Education, and both Democratic and Republican members of Congress. And they are all here because of the amazing work, amazing work that you, the members of our network, have done over the preceding year, reminding them how important skills policies are to helping our country achieve an equitable, inclusive economic recovery. Whether you were a member of one of our four industry recovery panels that met with the White House and agencies in Congress last year, or a member of one of our skill span coalitions that participated in our virtual infrastructure Hill Day, or a small business that joined us for Business Leaders United uh, meeting up on the Hill last year, or an online activist who's just looking to get more involved in your work, in our work. You've all been part of building the momentum for the crucial conversations that we're going to have over the next three days. And I'm also pleased that going virtual hasn't slowed us down in terms of achieving one of the key parts of the Skills Summit, which is connecting all of you to your elected officials. Over 400 of you from 43 states will be meeting with over 150 congressional offices over the next few days to educate them about the essential role that you see in your community where effective and equitable skills training is playing a role in getting workers and businesses back into this economic recovery. Your advocacy has already led to unprecedented federal investments in skills over the last year. And this week, we're going to hear from officials who are shaping how those initial investments are being implemented to make sure that they're addressing systemic racial inequities and expanding access to high quality jobs. And we'll be talking about the current debates that are still going on in Washington around necessary additional investments and where you can weigh in on those discussions. Uh, during this summit, you can participate in the conversation with our staff and attendees in a number of different ways. On social media, you can use the hashtag NSC Summit 2022. In the online chat during our plenary and training sessions and on our 2022 Skills Summit Conference app that I hope you all have downloaded from your phone's app store and on which you've created your attendee profile. Finally, before we get started, I wanna take a moment to thank the funding partners who made this event possible with their generous sponsorships. JP Morgan Chase and Company, the ECMC Foundation, Microsoft, and Walmart. And big props to the NSC staff and our partners at New Paradigm for their work in developing what I think is going to be an incredible three days of content. All right, let's get started. I wanna kick things off uh, with a conversation with a key leader from the Biden administration and then a national expert panel about where we've come with federal skills policies over the past year and where I hope we're going to be heading. I should mention that this discussion with Ambassador Susan Rice, director of the White House's Domestic Policy Council is not only our summit's opening plenary, it's also the third in a series of fireside chats we've had with national leaders about the importance of skills training as a tool to promote an inclusive economic recovery. You'll be able to find this and other fireside chats on the website nationalskillsfiresidechats.com. But before I talk to Ambassador Rice, let me give some background for those of you who've not been following NSC's coverage of these issues over the past year. As you know, Joe Biden ran for president proposing not just to help US workers and businesses recover from the pandemic, but to help them build back better 
whether that was a better infrastructure or healthcare system, or for many folks who were impacted by the COVID recession, including low wage workers, workers of color, women, folks without a college degree, if they would have a chance to prepare for a better paying career than the one they might have had prior to March 2020. And so early last year, President Biden proposed three different plans as part of that approach. The first was the American Rescue Plan, a $1.9 trillion relief package that was passed by Congress in March of 2021. The second was the American Jobs Plan, which was the president's initial infrastructure package, which included $100 billion in workforce training investment to make sure all Americans had a chance to train for some of the new jobs to be created in transportation, clean energy, broadband, and manufacturing and the American Families Plan, which included the president's $109 billion free community college initiative, available to degree students as well as to working folks seeking some technical certification connected to a real job. Most of the president's major workforce education and training proposals were in the Jobs and Families Plan. However, even in the American Rescue Plan, which has already been passed, there were some key programs that are now being implemented. Just recently, the Commerce Department under Secretary Gina Raimondo launched an Investing America's Communities initiative, which included $500 million of investment in workforce-focused industry partnerships called the Good Jobs Challenge. Applications for those grants just closed. And just a couple of weeks ago, First Lady Jill Biden and Education Secretary Miguel Cardona announced nearly $200 million in rescue plan funding to provide the kind of tuition and assistance and supportive services that NSC has long touted as important to help working students manage community college, work, and family simultaneously. As for the president's infrastructure package, as most folks know, in order to pass it on a bipartisan basis, it had to be significantly scaled down, which meant taking out most of the workforce training components. However, the resulting Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that passed last November, which we are now in the process of implementing, Still, it has some workforce components that we should be tracking. It includes the $2.75 billion in digital equity grants that can include digital upskilling to accompany the package's investments in broadband expansion and digital devices. And there's more than a billion dollars in other workforce investments connected to the transportation and energy sectors. Just recently, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, as part of his recently announced Good Jobs Initiative, specifically talked about how DOL was going to be working with the Departments of Energy and Transportation to harness the existing WIOA workforce system, as well as registered apprenticeships and free apprenticeships to help diversify the pipeline of new workers for these positions. So how those programs are going to be act, act, enacted and implemented effectively and equitably, that's something that we're gonna to discuss today with Ambassador Rice and tomorrow with Secretaries Raimondo, Cardona and Walsh. That still leaves the president's larger workforce training community college proposals. They were initially rolled into a larger three and a half trillion dollar build back better package that unfortunately could not get the support of all 50 Democratic senators in order to pass under the Senate's reconciliation rules. To meet those concerns, the House passed a smaller version of build back better, which still include $40 billion of various types of workforce funding in new industry partnerships between workforce organizations and unions and community colleges and local employers, and new investment and training for clean energy and climate related jobs, and billions in badly needed resources for an already overburdened WIOA workforce system. However, even that smaller house package was not able to get uh, 50 votes or express 50 votes from the, from the Senate. Uh, it also did not include the president's larger community college proposal. So now we're going to have to figure out how to deal with those issues in the context of things that have already been passed and things that we're still debating up on the Hill. But first, let me turn our discussion to one of the key architects of those original proposals. Ambassador Susan Rice is the director of the Domestic Policy Council, the group in the White House that drives President Biden's domestic policy agenda on issues ranging from economic mobility, higher education and workforce development, to healthcare, immigration, and racial equity. Ambassador Rice, thanks so much for joining me in our Skill Summit audience today. It's great to be with you, Andy. So let's get right into it. 2021, that was a tough year for everyone, particularly for those millions of workers and businesses who are economically sidelined by the pandemic. So last year, President Biden laid out a policy vision to not just help folks recover, but to help them get onto a pathway of something better, to help them build back better, whether that was a a better economy overall, or for some folks, a better career, maybe a better career than they'd had prior to the pandemic. 
Why does the president see worker education and training as so important to that vision? And what is the administration doing right now that you're most excited about in this space? Well, Andy, it, no doubt 2021 was definitely a tough year in many respects, with the pandemic and rising costs hitting families really hard. But we also saw the economy create an historic 6.6 .6 million jobs. We also saw the biggest drop in the unemployment rate on record uh, and the largest one year reduction in child poverty on record. So as the president likes to say, our best days are really still ahead. And that's certainly true when it comes to strengthening our workforce. If we're gonna unleash the full power of our investments in infrastructure, clean energy, and the care economy, it's essential that we have the skilled workforce to power those industries forward. It's also important that, we, that the benefits uh, of our coming jobs boom is shared by all Americans, and in particular, those who have traditionally been left behind in the labor market. As you know, and as our listeners know, the US has chronically underinvested in workforce development. Millions of jobs have gone unfilled in growing sectors like construction and healthcare. In fact, if you look at the average that other advanced economies spend on workforce and labor market programs, we in the United States currently spend just one fifth of that total. And we all agree that's not gonna cut it. This lack of investment is impacting all of us. A shortage of skilled workers saps economic growth and negatively impacts our communities. At the same time, the opposite is also true. Better educated workers yield benefits that spill over for other workers uh, and, and other communities. So President Biden recognizes the critical role that workforce development plays in strengthening our economy and increasing our competitiveness on the world stage. As one of the best examples of that, and one of the areas I'm most excited about right now is the passage of the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law uh, last November, which we're working very hard to implement. This law is a really big deal. It's the most consequential and wide ranging infrastructure legislation since the New Deal. And the investments in this legislation are gonna create millions of new jobs and help transform the overall economy. They present an opportunity to rebuild and transform the workforce, particularly by providing underserved communities with the training and the skills development that they will need to access good quality, unionized, in-demand jobs. Um, and that's what this law is gonna create. I'll also note that we are very much still working on our Build Back Better plan. The House passed legislation would make further critical investments in training American workers for high quality jobs in the fastest growing sectors. Historic investment in registered apprenticeship programs and in middle and high school career and technical education programs are part of that Build Back Better legislation. Um, investments that leverage America's community colleges, putting them at the center of our efforts to prepare the workforce of the future. And of course, targeting these investments to prioritize underserved communities and communities hardest hit uh, by our transforming economy. So for my part, there is a lot we are doing already in this space, a lot that I'm excited about and a great deal more to come. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a lot there already passed that we need to be paying attention to, even as we're having some of these other conversations on the Hill. I know you're part of them, we are, we are as well. Let, let me go to an issue that you raised in part of your comments here, which is, this is obviously, these are investments that the, enchi the entire economy needs. But there's particular folks for whom this is this is very important. Uh, you know, and you were instrumental in the development of the president's executive order on racial equity and support for underserved communities, which he signed on day one of his administration on inauguration day. So clearly, really important to him, really important to this administration. So, in the context of this, some of the policies we were just talking about, including the Infrastructure Act and maybe even elements of Build Back Better, you know, why is that executive order so foundational and how is it going to guide what the DPC is going to be trying to do as we're trying to implement the Infrastructure Act, Infrastructure Act and other elements like that? So we know that workers of color, particularly those of lower wage, are going to be included in this economic recovery. That's a really important question, Andy. Uh, and as you said, it was on day one that President Biden signed an executive order that directed the whole of the federal government uh, to do all that it can to advance equity and racial justice. And I'm proud that 
I've been uh, given the responsibility of quarterbacking that effort. As we try to continue to make progress tackling the pandemic and getting our economy back on track, as you know well, we truly cannot afford to return to the way things were before. Um, the president believes deeply that we have to seize this moment to reimagine and rebuild a new economy that serves everybody, leaves nobody out and no one behind. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which we've already touched on, is a great example of how we're doing that. If we implement the bipartisan infrastructure law to its full potential, we can make great progress towards narrowing the, way, the racial and gender wealth gaps, creating good jobs, addressing historic forms of discrimination and structural barriers that have held back women and people of color and people with disabilities, um, whether in the workplace or by advancing climate justice or by building rural and tribal prosperity, um, which all taken together would mean a more resilient and equitable future for millions and millions of Americans. Here at the White House, our team has focused intensively on developing strategies for that uh, equitable infrastructure implementation. Um, we're coordinating closely with our colleagues across the administration to ensure that we continue to make equity a priority in implementing this law. Mitch Landrieu, who is our coordinator for the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law and my colleague, uh, Brian Deese at the National Economic Council and I are working very closely together uh, along with uh, uh, the leaders of our cabinet uh, and the president and the vice president to ensure that we are making uh, use of the, the huge benefits of this law uh, to advance uh, an agenda that is beneficial to all. And those same core priorities of equity and racial justice are reflected across our other efforts to support workers and to strengthen communities and improve our competitiveness. We cannot have a system that perpetuates or promotes low quality jobs that, that hurt the economic security of work, working families and stall our growth and competitiveness. So most fundamentally, placement services and training have to lead to good jobs, uh, high quality jobs with wage progression, benefits, access to paid leave, opportunities for career advancement through training and education, and an assurance that workers can use their voices to improve their pay and working conditions. Many of the president's workforce development investments are built on evidence-based strategies for helping underserved communities to access and complete workforce development programs, the kind that lead to real middle-class jobs. These strategies include comprehensive supportive services, income supports, access to quality training programs, such as registered apprenticeships, um, as well as intensive career services and real and deep partnerships between employers, unions, community-based organizations, service providers, and community colleges. And that's gonna be our focus, whether we're talking about Build Back Better, the bipartisan infrastructure law, or any other efforts to support American workers. So there's a lot of players there, both on the ground, folks are gonna to have to be working effectively together, but as you were laying out that list of policies, I probably heard like five or six different federal agencies that were implicated by that list. So let's, let's just focus on three of them. Um, tomorrow, I'm gonna to be talking with three of the president's cabinet secretaries, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, and Education Secretary Miguel Cardona. Now they've made a public pledge that they're gonna to work together to try to most effectively implement these sets of policies. But you know, we know that interagency cooperation, interagency coordination is not an automatic. Um, so I, I'd be interested to hear from you from the perspective of the DPC and the White House, like what role are you going to play to make sure this is kind of a government-wide response and that those agencies and other agencies are working effectively together? Well, that's our job, right? We're not just an administration, we're a team. And I strongly believe that we've got to bring together the agencies, especially the ones you mentioned, but several others as well, as partners to share information and resources and to problem solve together. And that's what gives you stronger policy making, effective implementation, uh, both of which better serve the needs of the American people. So in recognition of that, what we're doing at the Domestic Policy Council with White House colleagues, including those that I've mentioned, mm -hmm. we've established a number of interagency working groups that support efforts like the timely implementation of the, the policies and programs 
in the bipartisan infrastructure law. In the case of workforce development, we're working to coordinate stronger integration between education and workforce training programs, which have historically, as you know, been spread across a number of different agencies. And that's a key part of ensuring that programs are high quality and effective and lead to good jobs. So, you know, Secretary Walsh, Secretary Cardona, Secretary Raimondo um, are my partners, along with other of my White House colleagues. We work very closely together um, because we understand that we can't do this work effectively in silos. There have to be very smooth linkages. Um, and that's very much the role of the White House policy councils uh, to ensure that those linkages are maximized. So, um, uh, it's what I love about this job. Uh, it was very similar to what I actually did as national security advisor on the, the national security and foreign policy side. It's making agencies cooperate, coordinate, and deliver results for the American people. Well, that is just absolutely so essential. And it is a huge job. Uh, but Ambassador Rice, I'm so thankful that you and the president are trying to lead this fight across all of those different agencies. Um, we look forward to working with you and talking to all of those agency leaders over the next couple of days. And just thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, we will look forward to coordinating with you in the future as well. Thank you so much, Andy. And, and thanks to all of you for the great work you're doing. Thanks. Thanks again to Ambassador Rice for taking some time with us today here at our Skill Summit. Uh, now let me turn to our panel of experts to get their reactions to some of what they just heard and offer their own thoughts about what they think still needs to be done to make things better for workers and businesses coming out of this pandemic. I'm gonna introduce each of them. First, we have Alex Camardell. He's the Director of Workforce Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies or America's Black Think Tank. Hi, Alex, how are you? Doing good, Andy, it's great to be here. Good to have you here. Uh, next, we have Jenny Sparandera. Jenny's Head of Programs in Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Andy. Hey, here. Uh, next, we have Derek Figures. Derek is the Labor and Economic Justice Director at the Sierra Club. Derek, good to have you here. Hey, Andy. Good to, have, good to be here. Uh, and finally, Jihang Lee. Jihang is the President and CEO of the Association of Community College Trustees, or in Washington lingo, ACCT. Jihang, good to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Andy, for the invitation and happy to participate today. Excellent. So all of you are kind of bringing different perspectives to this issue about what we're trying to do to build an inclusive economic recovery coming out of this pandemic. Um, and obviously there's a host of serious challenges that are facing working people from what's happened over the past couple of years. But as you know, here at the Skill Summit, we're trying to hone in on one particular part of what we think is the potential larger economic solution. And that's how is it that federal policy could it better invest in the skills and future careers of millions of working people who are most impacted by this crisis, crisis so that they're working and earning better than they were before the pandemic? And relatedly, how can we use those policies to better engage local industries so they can both benefit from these workforce investments, but also be partners in how it is that we're expanding their career opportunities for local folks? So we've kind of laid out some of the bigger picture issues about we had an American rescue plan, we had several proposals from the president, we have an infrastructure package that's passed, we have a build back better package that's currently being debated still on Congress, in Congress, I should say. Um, but let me ask from each of your particular perspectives, what were you most encouraged about by these debates over the past years in Washington about these skills and reemployment issues and what do you think was potentially the biggest miss or the biggest piece of unfinished business that we still need to start working on. And Alex, I'm gonna to turn to you to give you a chance to answer that question first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me today. Uh, again, Alex at the Joint Center. And for those who don't know, we're a 51 plus old organization, uh, also known as America's Black Think Tank, concerned with the economic prosperity of black communities in the United States. So I'll be talking about this from the perspective of uh, what we hope to see and, and, and desire for the future of Black workers. Um, and immediately, in terms of what I thought you know, uh, was encouraging, um, I, I have to take it to the local level just to, to start there and speak to how encouraging it was to see local workforce organizations, providers, even public systems rapidly adapt to the changing nature 
of serving participants in Black communities and in low-income communities. And um, of course, they did so having to make several sacrifices, right? Um, as we know that these systems were woefully underfunded uh, coming into this, this pandemic, but they in many ways made it work, whether that was, you know, pivoting to like mobile uh, response opportunities, creating virtual um, uh, office spaces for training participants to come in and apply or enroll into training services and et cetera. So really encouraged by that. Um, bringing it up uh, to a different level a little bit, I, I was really encouraged by some of the flexibilities offered through supportive services for training participants. I immediately think about flexibility offered through childcare. We know that caregiving responsibilities play a massive role in the ability of working parents to be able to not just uh, take time away from work, but also to participate in education and training. And states did uh, work quickly to adapt to that challenge. And there is so much that is left to be seen as it relates to creating and supporting childcare infrastructure for, for Black communities in particular, as they have, as states and local areas are receiving billions of dollars in childcare money that hasn't even been distributed just yet, but will support that care, uh, care infrastructure for these families so they can depend on that whenever they actually participate in, in, in training. Um, I also want to mention like the significant effort to rethink different components of our workforce system has been encouraging as well. Um, I'm in particularly happy with how we're thinking about registered apprenticeships and how we could do a better job to engage Black workers through apprenticeships. We know that just one in 10 apprentices are Black workers, so we have a long way to go in that regard, but seeing new investments from the federal government uh, to help retool uh, and, and support local areas and states to develop more equitable approaches to registered apprenticeship is really exciting too. Um, in terms of some of the big misses, um, so I, I mean, I'd say some of the biggest flops over the last year obviously include the expiration of critical safety net support, um, the exclusion of tuition-free community college from the Build Back Better plan, or even like the whittled down skills training investments um, which are still being considered in Congress and, and important. Um, but for, for us, the, the biggest miss isn't necessarily um, a piece of legislation, but this kind of general approach to recovery policy, um, which is this status quo reaction to just settle for unjust outcomes for Black workers. And it, seemed, it would seem at this point that that is actually just the preferred policy in many ways, just to leave Black workers behind. Um, and there's always this attractiveness um, or something attractive to lawmakers in Congress and across the administration about using the success of white workers, in particular um, white men, as a benchmark for success in our recovery. Um, once they have achieved low unemployment rates, we begin to move forward as though millions of Black workers uh, don't continue to struggle. Um, you know, so for instance, the latest job state number shows that Black uh, unemployment rate remains more than two times higher than it does for white workers. And this is where we were prior to the pandemic. So even as the country was experiencing its longest period of economic expansion, um, this was still considered acceptable. And that, to us, is actually unacceptable. Um, this, is, this is the way that systemic racism works. So um, this commands that we pass legislation that goes beyond making sure that white workers are doing well and instead ensures that all workers are doing well. Um, so if we don't do that, then it'll be, I think, another uh, huge miss for us. So Alex, it seems like what you're saying is that even though there's been a lot of effective effort on the ground and we still have some things that we need to get across the finish line in DC, a very important component of that is how is it that we're gonna measure success, right? And are we gonna be paying attention to those workers, including black workers who are most in need of some assistance and investment in their futures? And that's gonna to have to be a key part of however it is we're assessing not only what's already been passed, but also what we still are trying to get uh, through Congress. That seems to be a really important component that we can come back to. Yep. Jenny, let me turn to you. For you, uh, for JP Morgan, both as a corporate leader, but also as a philanthropic investor, like what do you, how are you viewing what's happened over the past year? So um, thanks, Andy, and, and thanks for, for having me. And, and I hope that we can all do this in, in person sometime soon. Um, but 
first of all, just picking up on some of what Alex said. So Alex, I appreciate that you started with the local context. I'll just say, you know, prior to joining the team at JP Morgan, I worked in local government. And to me, something that unites local government and business is just a practicality around, we need to get things done. <laughs> like there's a certain level of talk on topics, but at the end of the day, it's also about, you know, sort of getting the job done. And so there's a through line to me there, and I'm sort of eager to bring both of those experiences to bear here. Um, you know, in terms of how we approach the topic, so as you said, Andy, in the intro, so I sit in corporate responsibility at JP Morgan Chase, and we're always looking for where can we authentically engage in an issue and really sort of bring who we are to bear in, in a real sense. So for us, that includes philanthropic investments that we make through the foundation, which is where I sit and, and the team I lead um, is based. Jobs and skills has been a part of that agenda for more than 10 years now. So I'll kind of pull through some of the things that have been encouraging in, in a moment. Um, it's also thinking about our experience as an employer. I know today we want to talk a little bit about how businesses experienced this, and particularly small and mid-sized firms. That is not us, but we certainly hear from clients. We have you know, small businesses, we bank, um, we have a whole philanthropic agenda around business. So looking at the pieces that connect the dots between these issues is really important for us. And then we have a policy center, we have a think tank that looks at, you know, sort of customer data. You know, how is it that all of that information enables us to be, you know, supportive, influential in this space? And, and where do we really make sense to play? So that that's a little bit of grounding of just, you know, sort of what's the lens that I'm going to try to bring to the conversation today. Um, in terms of encouraging, you know, I'll, I'll kind of call out a few things here. One, focus on placing people in career pathways or on career pathways. You know, for us, high quality career pathways has long been a focus of our philanthropic agenda. And uh, we know that the quality variable is, is really key to focus in on. So we've made significant investments in state infrastructures and local infrastructures to really help connect the dots between educational stakeholders, business stakeholders, and ultimately learners and workers so that, you know, ideally we're supporting better outcomes for, for all of those groups. Um, so, you know, that's been a big key part of our strategy. We've been heartened to see how that's been picked up by the administration. Um, the second kind of thing I'd focus in on is, you know, how do we create an enabling environment for workers and businesses to succeed. And I think that's where investments in infrastructure, where the discussion around broadband access, which is something that, you know, gosh, if we weren't focused on it before the pandemic, when we all had to shift to the remote, you know, sort of work environment, you know, it just laid bare where those gaps certainly exist. So I think for us, you know, seeing action there, um, I think Alex just mentioned apprenticeship infrastructure, you know, just really been encouraged by developments in those issue areas. Um, and then for us, you know, prioritizing the closing of equity gaps. I do think Alex makes a couple of really important points there around like what makes that real? How do we focus on what outcomes are most meaningful there? I think we've long been dogged in the workforce development space by not really focusing in on the right outcomes and not really supporting system actors to track the right sort of long-term economic mobility outcomes. So is there a way that we can use this moment to kind of make real progress on that front. Um, that's something we'll be looking for. Maybe that leads a little bit to the, you know, what, what more is there to do and not maybe misses so much as where can we go deeper in the future. Um, before the brand was adopted, shall we say, we, we were kind of talking about, is this a moment to build back better? Frankly, colleagues in Europe were talking about that coming out of their policy environment. And I think that point about we don't want to use this to revert to the status quo. We want to figure out how we can sort of leap forward. Something I'm eager to talk to everybody or talk with everybody about is particularly when we look at those future of work trends, how is this a moment where we really lean in and make progress? There is somewhere wrapped up in all of this chaos an opportunity to really align our DEI goals with our business goals, with our practices. 
Um, so thinking about how can we push further there is a, is a big part of our focus. Yeah, we've said this in many different contexts about how that future of work stuff that we thought was years away, um, you know, this economic disruption over the past two years has brought all of that right here in front of us, right? And so we have, we don't only have workers who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic, we have a lot of folks in the workforce who may not be able to hang on to their jobs if we don't get them ahead mm -hmm. of this rapid change in technological curves that many of them are seeing in their industries. And so it's just hugely important even for current workers in addition to those who wanna become uh, folks in a skill, skilled career path. So thanks for bringing that up, Jenny. And we'll definitely come back to some of that. Uh, hey, Derek, let me ask you, you know, so obviously the environmental movement played a big role in a lot of the conversations uh, over the past year in DC. Um, I'm curious kind of what, from your perspective, kind of like what you were encouraged by or whatnot. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, let me start by saying thank you to the National Skills Coalition for having me join this distinguished panel. And thanks to Ambassador Rice for raising such important points on how important her role is in guiding the implementation of the bipartisan law across agencies. At Sierra Club, it has long been our charge to highlight the environmental challenges that some of our most vulnerable communities face. My role is focused on identifying strategies that address these challenges by building healthy communities. So when I think about the most encouraging um, signs uh, from some of the, the past year um, and efforts in Washington, I think of the training dollars associated with clean transit. Um, there's about $7.5 billion um, dedicated to EV charging infrastructure that is rapidly sparking an EV manufacturing revolution in this country. Um, and the legend of the automotive industry we all know is that it essentially built the middle class. So these efforts by the bipartisan law will go a long way to support struggling workers to train for more quality, family-sustaining jobs with good benefits. I also think about the $5 billion dedicated to school buses as well. Mm -hmm. um, but additionally, I think about environmental re remediation and reduction of legacy pollution. Um, there's uh, some $15 billion dedicated to lead service line replacement. Um, there's also about $3 billion dedicated to uh, energy efficiency and, and low income homes <clears throat> and a host of other training dollars distributed throughout the bipartisan law. Uh, to the question around uh, the biggest miss <laughs> or the largest piece of unfinished business, um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't raise uh, Build Back Better uh, for one, but I'm also encouraged by the remarks that uh, your remarks about Secretary Walsh and Cardona as their agencies are key to implement, implementation from a training and career readiness perspective. But I think the bipartisan law could have done more <clears throat> excuse me, from the outset to yield visible guidance from those agencies, particularly in the bill. Um, and then additionally, we, we were disappointed in the, the fact that the clean energy tax credits for uh, American-made EV, man, uh, EV manufactured vehicles, offshore wind, um, those credits we saw uh, as somewhat of a path to those good, good quality jobs we speak of. Um, so, I, you know, I think those are some of the main pieces. And then additionally, I, I think, raising um, voting rights just just because a lot of what we're talking about is directly connected to the inequities we speak of from our perspective so i think it's important to raise that as well yeah thanks for bringing all of that in Derek. and i and i know we're all going to want to talk a little bit more about kind of like what we haven't gotten by not getting build back better pass and we want to come back to some of the things that the, all of that stuff that's particularly around climate and and clean energy jobs and things like that which is still waiting for action uh, on the hill but thanks for that for that wrap up Jihang, let me turn to you. Obviously, community colleges have been a big part of the conversation. It was a big part of the conversation even on the campaign trail before the president was elected uh, and has certainly been in the, in the focus of conversations in DC and in terms of recovery. What is your feelings these days about where community colleges are sitting in the current conversation? Well, Andy, thank you again and to the Skills Coalition for the invitation to participate today. Uh, for us in the community college sector, I think we're very excited about being included in many of these discussions around skills, around apprenticeship, around job training, and how we can expand the opportunities for Americans across this country in urban areas and rural areas to uh, have jobs that pay meaningful wages uh, to uh, have them ascend to the middle class. I think for us, that is the most important thing that we are trying to work with the current administration. And uh, the previous week, we had Secretary Cardona, uh, Secretary Walsh join us for our own conference to talk about some of these items. Um, we are, especially since the pandemic has begun to where we are today, 
uh, we are seeing significant shiftings within the labor market. And uh, our community colleges are, to a certain extent, figuring out exactly which programs are going to be continuing on, uh, which programs might need to be shelved for a period of time. And also, our community colleges are thinking about how do we incentivize and recruit and get our students into the classroom. Uh, and we've been uh, very excited that the, that the current administration is engaging us in this process um, because we do know that uh, education is one of the best indicators of uh, economic success that we have in this country. Um, in terms of things that uh, could, uh, so the other thing that I would just mention as a significant positive that we're continuing to work on is the additional resources that were included in Build Back Better for our community college job training program. Uh, we think that's very important. We, need, uh, we believe we need those critical resources to build these middle-class job positions, including large expansions around the health fields uh, and other manufacturing type of um, uh, occupations. Uh, in terms of obviously one of the things that has uh, transpired in the last uh, couple weeks to the last couple months that is obviously a significant disappointment, uh, and we just had the first lady join us who also mentioned it, uh, was the loss of free community college. Um, we believe uh, as an association and with my colleagues at AACC, the American Association of Community Colleges, free community colleges is important to us because the universal message around higher education and aspiring to higher education. Um, one of the things that we don't do well in higher education, and you see this when you step onto a campus, we don't necessarily uh, make the process of applying for federal financial aid, applying for state aid, or any other additional scholarships, uh, supporting students to go through the course catalog, picking courses, uh, if you are a first generation student, a student of color who, you know, uh, that has family that has not had a historical participation in the higher education system, who is that person that is escorting you through the process? Uh, and we will also believe that the universal message around free community college could have incentivized thousands of uh, families to go to a community college and aspire for higher education. I think that's important. And we're seeing that play out in some local and state communities where we are seeing increases in participation within higher education. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we'll, and let's come back to kind of like where that vision for free community college might fit within uh, future conversations in DC. But I think Jihang, you make a very good point, which is and it's similar to some of the things that Derek was saying. It's like, there were bigger things that different constituents were trying to win in DC that have not been won, but there are some things that are already in play. And I think the examples you were giving in terms of funding that's already been admitted, made available to community colleges, even including under the American Rescue Plan and, and with some of these support services, this $198 million that um, uh, the First Lady and Secretary Cardona just announced recently at a community college in New Jersey, just as an example of there are things that we should be paying attention to now. It's not like community colleges aren't getting a federally funded role here. It's just not as expansive as we might have hoped when we got into things at the beginning of last year. And so we need to be keeping an eye on that part of the, of the ball as well, for sure. All right, well, thanks. So this, you all have kind of provided a good place for us to continue some of our conversation. But before, um, before we go any further, I wanna give you all a chance, um, you, know, you all heard what Ambassador Rice had to say from the perspective of the White House and the DPC about kind of like what they feel has been accomplished over the past year and where it is that they wanna be focusing some of their attention. I'm curious if anybody has any reactions to any of Ambassador Rice's comments and I'll just let anybody go in any order, just, just feel free to, to chime in. Right, I'm gonna call on somebody. Alex, let me go to you first. Um, uh, you know, Obviously, uh, the ambassador talked a fair amount because she was so instrumental in that executive order on equity and underserved communities. I'm sure you probably have some thoughts about that and amongst other things that she, that she talked about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was, I was pausing a little bit because I'm still reacting or re just reflecting on Ji Hang's points about like the community college student experience and just thinking, reflecting on my own experience. I was a community college student for a short period of time and to know that, you know, if I would have been able to cover those costs 
uh, earlier on in my educational journey, like the impact that would have had on me figuring out my own career path earlier on in my, <laughs> where I wouldn't have wasted so much money trying to like figure it out uh, later on would have been monumental for me, um, particularly as a black student, right? Who also entered into higher ed with not as much uh, family wealth and assets to, to partake in that journey. So agree and really encourage and thrilled to hear the, the association's perspective on, uh, and sadly, sadly, the disappointment in that um, and the loss of that provision. But I digress. Um, uh, really uh, appreciated Ambassador Rice's perspective and, and messaging and kind of vision laid out there. I have to say the Joint Center um, was invited to kind of share some recommendations around the bipartisan infrastructure deal that is now moving to the implementation stage. Um, and we were you know, excited to weigh in and find ways to prioritize opportunities for black workers to be um, successful in, in getting access to the jobs created. We know that there weren't as many robust workforce investments within the infrastructure package, which made the, the passage of Build Back Better even more important, right? Um, but even without all of that, there were still ways that we wanted to ensure that Black workers got a piece of the pie, essentially, um, here. And uh, I'm really grateful to the administration for opening up the door to that conversation. Um, I think that speaks to kind of the, the deliberate nature of equity through the EO and what they're hoping to accomplish through that. I think that this current administration um, and Ambassador Rice and her colleagues included present a window of opportunity for us to kind of get things right. Um, a very important window of opportunity uh, and not just in terms of practical things that maybe the, the uh, that Congress might do, but just in terms of messaging around these issues, we're getting a whole different tone around in, in around what you know some of these provisions would mean not just for our current worker workforce but also for the future workforce which I really really appreciate um you know but of course I, like I fear that you know um, and I kind of mentioned this earlier in terms of like what we're missing um, I fear that if we're not going to respond to these issues with uh, a focus on how black workers are faring in the economy, then we're gonna squander this window of opportunity. And we're already starting to see the message of the administration say, okay, you know, uh, greatest and quickest recovery in history, check, like we're good, right? Um, that is extremely disheartening as uh, a black person <laughs> in this country who again, feels uh, kind of left behind in the narrative of economic recovery um, once again. Uh, so I would, you know, just say to, to, you know, in terms of my reaction that we need to slow down, take stock of where we are and ensure that we're, you know, uh, aiming for success for all workers, once again, not just uh, white workers, because that seems to be the status quo that we're returning to. If we if the goal, and I really appreciated Jenny's points earlier, like if the goal was to get back to uh, February 2020, right before we hit the pandemic, um, then that was the wrong, you know, goal here. That's that's not what we were hoping for. Um, the idea was to build back better, not build back to February 2020. And here we are going right back to to February 2020, if not, you know, in a, in worse shape than we were before. Um, so I want us to, you know, just not ignore the realities that Black workers are facing right now. Because um, if we do, then we convince ourselves that we don't need a hundred billion dollars in workforce investment, right? Uh, we convince ourselves that we just need a little bit to get by, and that's not fair, right? That just takes us to where we were um, earlier. Um, so, so yeah. Thank, thanks, uh, Ji Hang. Looks like you had something you want to add on here. Yeah, and I appreciate Alex's comments to this because it, you know one of the things that we have been doing and uh, having conversations with our community college leaders is the following. You know, community colleges in FY uh, fall of 20 and fall of 21 have experienced significant decrease in enrollments. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're for a myriad of reasons. Obviously, it's led to because of the pandemic, it's because of childcare, it's because of other factors. Um, but it's also because our students are working. They are not doing part time, they're doing full time. Um, but they're also pursuing opportunities. For example, you can work at Amazon for $15 an hour and get a small bonus. You can work at Costco at $17 an hour. 
fast food down the street from my home is $15 an hour. Um, I believe there's even one fast food that I heard was paying $25 an hour in an urban area. So these are the things that our former students who are going to our institutions part-time are exploring and utilizing full-time. And, you know, Alex mentioned, we don't necessarily want to go back to February of 2020. We want to build back better. And I think part of that conversation we need to have internally and also within our workforce system is the following. It's just not that we, you, you are employed and you have a $15 an hour job. We know, for an example, that you know, these positions aren't stackable. You, know, you can't do this position and make $25 and $40 an hour four years later. And I think this is why it's important to have programs like the Community College uh, Career Program to ensure that we can provide a pathway to a meaningful middle-class wage. Uh, that has benefits, that uh, does support our students uh, uh, from a very long-term process. And, you know, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, education and stacking education is so important because, uh, you know, if you have credits, you can take your credits everywhere. And so therefore, if you get a certificate, you can get an associate's degree, you can get a bachelor's degree. So I think those are all things that are very, very important as we think about the future of job training in this country. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, I have a few comments, and, and thanks to Alex and Ji Hang for some of their comments related to uh, Ambassador Rice's uh, comments. Uh, I think the good quality jobs piece that uh, Ambassador Rice raised is a huge, uh, huge um, indicator, right, for you know where our where a number of our careers and the future of work can go. Um, and I think part of the answer to that is is in the Department of Education and CTE. I think career and technical education is a huge pathway that is often overlooked. I mean, for Christ's sake, we don't even have a, uh, an, an administrator for Octave right now, and which is <laughs> alarming for me, uh, because I think if the, the dots are not connected between agencies, as Ambassador Rice is trying to do, um, we're, we're, gonna really, we're going to really find ourselves in a very um, 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 difficult situation in terms of um, just kind of US competitiveness, right? Um, and that and that goes to, that also go, and to Alex's points around uh, flexibility of uh, kind of workforce development, kind of guidance and those pieces. Um, why not make that permanent? I actually was going to say that later, but I feel like this is the best time to say it. I mean, making uh, some level of permanence for what we learned closes some of these equity gaps is is a note that needs to be taken, right? Um, and I think I think I'll leave it at that. I mean, I do want to point one one more thing out that, that Alex raised around. Um, Kind of this uh, leaving this this issue this theme this theme of leaving uh, communities of color, particularly Black communities, behind. We had we saw it in a, we saw it with the green uh, the uh, the New Deal, right? And we are seeing it here. And I think that's what uh, you know. I just want to kind of overemphasize that point that Alex is making because uh, the economy is moving at a, at the at a clip that is it's it's incredible. And I think it's a very important note to recognize this opportunity that we have not only with Build Back Better but the opportunity with the dollars that are about to get on the ground now. That agility point, I don't think can be underscored enough. And this is kind of a point I was going to raise later, but when we think about where private or more flexible resources can be supportive, you know, helping build that muscle, because that is a capacity that is just missing. And we have to acknowledge that and, and figure out it. it's not missing everywhere, but the good examples of it are still too few and far between in my mind in terms of system actors. Um, so I, I completely agree with that. And it takes resourcing. You know, one of the things that Ambassador Rice talked about was, you know, sort of supporting coordination and connections. And that takes resources. It's always underinvested in, under invested in. It's a place where private resources can be supportive, but when do we get out of the game? And when, when is that then supported in a more systemic way? Like there just hasn't been the kind of handoffs. I think that we always tell ourselves, oh yes, we use philanthropy as sort of re you know, R&D um, funding. And then we partner with policymakers to take it to scale. I think, you know, we have to really examine those linkages and figure out how we are connecting them more clearly. I'll, I'll just add that in February of 2020, we happened 
to coincidentally be re-releasing uh, our commitment to career education. And so right, you know, three weeks before everything kind of went sideways um, in a clearer way, we were talking about investing in these connections, supporting states and localities and partnering. And that was the successor program to one that we had funded a few years prior in which, you know, Secretary Raimondo and Secretary Walsh were, these were big parts, you know, in their previous uh, roles, big parts of their sort of winning state applications. So I'm also really hopeful that there's just been some practical experience that they and others have gained over the last few years that we can now really leverage in terms of what comes next. Yeah, this point about uh, kind of like where the different pieces are fitting together. I mean, I think for, for all of us, here who work on things like federal policy and kind of like the inadvertent silos are kind of created between agencies and authorizing committees and things like that. And I think that um, to the point about you wanted to have agility and the ability for folks to be working and collaborating on the ground together, and there are different types of resources that can support that. But throughout all of this, um, if everybody has a shared set of goals and a shared set of measures, it makes it easier to kind of hold everybody equally accountable to a shared agenda. Um, and, you know, to the points that several folks made, starting with what Alex was talking about, if inclusion and advancement for those who were not working well before the pandemic is not a clear metric that every agency and every program is being held to, um, there's going to be a lot of intentionality behind this, but not necessarily a lot that we're going to be able to show for it, you know, a year or two from now, once we kind of are past this, this influx of federal resources. And that is a huge challenge, I think for all of us to kind of figure out from a policy and advocacy perspective to make sure that that's that everybody is being held to that that common sense of accountability. I think it's something that the White House is going to have to do a fair amount to kind of achieve that. I'm curious if folks think, having seen these things in other contexts, is that achievable? What is it that we need to do to kind of encourage encourage kind of like that government wide commitment to those kinds of those kinds of outcomes? I'll go. I, I think I think it comes down to um, just kind of former guidance and incentives from uh, related agencies. I, I would think Department of Labor, similar to uh, what Ji Hang raised, uh, the Department of Labor, and um, and I, I I think I raised this at one point or another. Um, the Department of Labor and Department of Education weren't necessarily prominent in terms of uh, kind of leadership on uh, implementation or at least uh, the just kind of you know the roadshow, if you will, of the bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, and I think now that, we, the, you know, the bill is passed, I think having some level of incentives from Department of Labor around technical assistance and some other pieces that kind of help um, marginalized communities kind of navigate these opportunities through the public workforce system um, is, is you know, much needed. And I think that might be one of the, the many solutions or strategies that could be um, kind of employed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I want to double, you know, what, what Derek's saying there. I think like it, public policy 101 is that the implementation side of things is just where things kind of tend to fall apart and why we find ourselves returning back to square one so often. And I think now, you know, something that I'm reminded of through this work, having, you know, being a federal, you know, policy advocate and researcher now, having been a state policy person before, is that, you know, the federal government sets a pretty, like generally a pretty, pretty low bar in terms of how to make some of these things really, you know, shake and, and make a difference. And I really appreciate the work of like the National Skills Coalition and all of its state allies and advocates that are actually pushing to capture some of the guidance or the lack thereof when it comes to BIF and uh, eventual WIOA reauthorization and uh, maybe some components of Build Back Better um, that are going to have to be tailored and curated to meet the needs of state and local communities um, so that they can be uh, actually realized some, some of the goals around racial equity and economic equity, et cetera. So like really investing in like that movement building piece is super important. Um, because without it, you we'll have kind of the symbolic framework that's been distributed to state and local areas where people, you know, aren't as responsive to community as as they should be um, there. So just wanted to underscore what 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 was being said there. I, I was just going to add, I I love that point because Andy, to your to your comment intentionality is essential, but it's not sufficient. I think we've also found, right, you can have really intentional programming guidance, but you need something on the other end to help people really drive towards outcomes. So um, I just, I completely agree. 
All right, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to pivot to some of the things that we're trying to look forward to. So we know that we've got a set of things we need to be paying attention to in terms of implementation of these, these other policies that have already been implemented, but there's a bunch of things that are kind of up for discussion still on the Hill, some of them in the context of recovery policy, some in, in other, in other legislative discussions. So Derek, let me come back to you because we talked, a, you, you mentioned as we were talking about where the environmental community, things that are already in play because of the passage of the infrastructure package. Um, but you know things like the Civilian Climate Corps, something that was a big priority for the environmental community in the context of Build Back Better. So that's that's still there. Um, you know, I'm curious, kind of like what you think the pathway forward is on some of those issues, or is it something where there's enough to work on, even just what's already been passed, that you think that folks have got their hands full just on the the infrastructure plan and its implementation? I, I do think people somewhat have their hands full, but there's plenty, there's plenty left to, uh, to address. Um, and I, I think some of the, the, the pieces that are left to address are, you know, to the extent clean energy projects exist, um, some level of high, high road labor standards need to be um, included. And I think, you know, part of that includes access to unions, um, local hire and apprenticeships as, as Alex raised, um, need to be part and parcel across the agencies as these components uh, lead to the types of good quality jobs we're talking about. Um, in addition, I mean, there's there's a number of pieces that that, that we are excited about, as I mentioned earlier, um, around em environmental re uh, remediation and, and kind of leg legacy pollution reduction are, are some pieces that are kind of connected to the uh, career, the civilian, uh, the, the tri-C's is what I call them, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, but also, uh, I, I just kind of going back to CTE and the idea of uh, the Civ Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, those are career pathways for broader um, environmental um, and, and climate change work. So I think it's important that those pieces do re remain in Build Back Better. And I think it's important, you know, just kind of back to that point I raised about competitiveness. Um, a lot of countries are, are recognizing the connections between uh, the challenges we face as a country um, in terms of climate and, and some of the commitments we've made, you know, so I think it's important to kind of uh, look at that from, from that lens. You know, Derek, uh, I mean, it, was, it was a while ago, but I think we were both working in Washington at the time. You know, so 10 years ago when the American Reinvestment Recovery Act was passed and there was a lot of talk about green jobs. And I think there, some will raise some skepticism about this focus on this today. It's like, oh, that's just what we were doing 10 years ago. I mean, but obviously the situation, electric vehicles is one good example. We didn't really have electric vehicles and, and they were not being sold the way they're being sold now. Like, there's a lot of things that are different now than we had 10 years ago. Like, what do you what do you think is different that's going to be different than the green jobs experience that we had from back in 2009, 2010? Well, number one, I, I think I, I don't think um, electric vehicles had about nine percent of the market share for uh, right. the automotive industry. So that I think it was somewhere in the I, I, I'm not even sure if Tesla was hundreds, out yet. Maybe hundreds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the, so the needle hadn't even the needle hadn't hadn't even been, hadn't even been threaded, so to speak. Um, but in addition, I, I you know that's that's kind of the big question, right? Is is where are the dollars for these clean energy projects um, that are actually already underway? Um, all we're trying to do is 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 have a situation where the clean energy projects are, are supported, right? Um, and it's similar to um, sim similar to Jenny's uh, uh, comments around. You know, we're we're starting this this uh, we're spinning this wheel, but but who's going to carry it, right? And, you know, and and so we have offshore wind projects in Montana, in New England, um, including Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey, um, and and I'm, I'm, there's a number of battery plants being opened in the South, um, not only EV manufacturing plants, but also battery plants and uh, critical minerals have to be mined. So that's some some pieces that we're looking at as well. Um, these are the green jobs at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, you know, if you really look at it, we're, we're looking at possibly or potentially a manufacturing re revolution across the, across a number of sectors. And those are the green jobs that that's, that's what it's, it's not solar panels. You notice I didn't really talk about solar panels. Right. Yeah. All right. Like, so the market, the market dynamics are just totally different now. Than they totally. were to go. Alex, go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to highlight that it's encouraging to see the expansion of green jobs and, I, you know, I actually read something recently that they're looking at um, uh, wind farms in the Gulf of Mexico, which is, you know, in the south, which, you know, is where I live. And that, you know, when I go out to the west and, or the Midwest and I see that, I think it's beautiful and amazing. And to see that maybe like off the shoreline of uh, Alabama or Mississippi would be very encouraging. 
Um, I'm in Georgia and uh, we actually have recently, one of our biggest economic deals in the history of our state is with an EV uh, battery plant um, in South Georgia. And I just wanna highlight you know, that while those jobs could be good jobs and should be good jobs, that they're not all, uh, it's not a universal you know, concept, I think, across these plants. And as they expand in the South where there are far fewer labor protections and things yes. like that, um, they have found ways to exploit their workforce, um, both their uh, US born workforce, as well as their foreign born workforce. And we need to be very vigilant and, and cautious about the way that those agreements are, are made uh, with, with manufacturers, um, you know, under the umbrella or veil of the green economy. So um, I just want, I'm just, because I've just seen that play out in recent years uh, here, um, and as those, uh, as that grows and expands across the country, we need to just be very vigilant and, and careful around the type of jobs. And that goes not just for like the green jobs, right, but for any new created jobs through infrastructure, through BIF, like our main talking point is that all jobs that are created need to have some standard of a good job. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I definitely have to comment on Alex. I really appreciate you raising that, Alex, because it's, because that is, it's kind of that lowest common denominator. You're almost, you, you, you suggest around um, um, black communities, right? The lowest common denominator is the South at the end of the day. That is where everything, you know, there's, that's where everyone is moving, right? The EV manufacturers, uh, the battery plants um, and the labor protections that don't exist, the, the broad inequities that are exacerbated by voting rights protections or that don't exist. I mean, this this is, and that's why those clean energy tax credits are um, essential because they help create the capacity to cr create uh, union jobs. And, that, and, and that's kind of, I mean, so I really appreciate you raising that because that is it's such a frustration of mine. And, and no one seems to listen. So thank you so much for raising it. I really appreciate well, it. Folks are listening here for sure. Thank you, Derek. But I want to go back to Alex first because in Build Back Better, there was a proposal that we were going to have a several billion dollar investment in the existing WIOA workforce system. And I know that you know, you've been working with us. We've been trying to do at National Skills Coalition a series of listening sessions. You've been helping us set some of them up just to kind of hear for folks on the ground if we were going to have a system that's been underinvested for so many years, if we had the chance to actually reform it with, an, with a new infusion of capital, like what are the kinds of things that we would like to see from that workforce system that we currently aren't seeing? I'm curious, kind of like, as whether that happens in Build Back Better or happens in real reauthorization conversations that we have on the Hill, like what are the kinds of things that you're hearing that you're hoping to get out of that kind of conversation? Thank you. I'll, and I'll I will respond to this, but also invite you know others to weigh in on this because, uh, like Ji Hang, I'm sure there are community college perspectives on Wheel and and others. But um, the the you know this is another example of a policy that sets a pretty basic floor and gives states and local areas a ton of opportunity to go past or beyond kind of the federal framework and in, in really advance equity. But what we're really hoping can happen through, whether it's through these new investments through Build Back Better or through reauthorization is a stronger framework for performance accountability. Um, we are hearing even from providers themselves who you know, often don't even have the total infrastructure to, to track outcomes for workers um, that they are struggling not to reproduce uh, occupational segregation through the federal workforce system. And that's something that has a pretty disparate effect on communities of color and workers of color who are overrepresented in the public workforce system and, and through uh, local workforce efforts, board efforts. So I think that's something that is um, we're, we're pushing like really hard on is ensuring that programs, providers that actually are serving communities of color and low, you know, people with high barriers to employment, like by, by their mandate, are not just being placed in any job, but in a good job. We're looking at what does it mean to apply a job quality, a high road employer uh, framework to the WIOA system so that it delivers on its promise of improving economic mobility and prosperity for, for individuals with barriers to employment. So um, there are a lot of challenges and roadblocks to getting there, including um, uh, resistance to race, uh, race conscious metrics, right? Um, we're in a very uh, anti 
uh, you know, racism, historic systemic structural racism like environment right now. So it's making it difficult to be a little bit more firm in terms of race conscious uh, progress through WIOA at the federal level, um, which is a which is a big disappointment. But um, that opens the door for opportunities to do that at the state and local area that I'm encouraged by. Um, so performance accountability tied to uh, outcomes for workers of color is a top priority and um, uh, an opportunity that that is definitely uh, before us today. Thanks, Alex. Um, does anyone have a response to Alex? Otherwise, I'm going to give Jenny a chance because I because I had leapfrog over her to come back in on the conversation. And Jenny, maybe I can tee you up and say, um, you know, I, so we've talked a lot about job quality. We've talked a lot about equity and things like that. So. I'm curious, as you're kind of thinking through how these issues are kind of landing with the business community, like where do you think, both from a corporate leadership perspective and from a philanthropic perspective, like where is it that you feel like the bank is going to be, JP Morgan is going to be weighing in on some of these issues moving forward? Um, well, th thanks for that question, Andy. You know, maybe a couple of thoughts that I'll try to connect. Um, so one thing that just is kind of constantly reiterated for me, and I don't know if this will resonate with, with the other panelists, is that when we are engaging in conversations about, you know, sort of recruitment or upskilling or reskilling from our perspective, and I think a lot of other employers find themselves here, we're talking about talent. And parsing into all of these little pieces, I think sometimes makes more sense coming from a public administration side than it does for the businesses that are sort of engaging with these systems. And if that's true for us, and we have a lot of resources and very sophisticated HR stakeholders internally, I can only, you know, sort of imagine what it feels like for small businesses and mid-sized firms who are really trying to figure out how to navigate these systems. And so, you know, I think it was a bit of a, um, optimistic view, but the idea really of a one-stop shop or a single front door to a system where you don't have to know exactly how the community college is plugged in versus the public workforce agency versus the youth administrator versus the vocational education. I mean, just something that really does try to make that more friendly um, for both the, you know, the people navigating it who just want to do better by themselves and their families and the businesses and employers who are willing to kind of engage in it. You know, I just think, you know, Alex and Andy, the, the listening work that you're doing and the way to really try to connect those pieces, because when, when Ji Hang was speaking, you know, to me, there's just so much more work we have to continue to do to break down the idea that you go and you get your education for 16 years and then you get a single job and you hook into that job and that is it for you know the next 30 40 years of your working life that sort of ability to really kind of serially reconnect with this system both as a business or an employer and as a learner is is something that i think we, we keep talking about but we haven't really made good on explaining what that that looks like and just maybe real quickly where where do i think we can play a productive role we have investments in communities all around the US, all around the world. There are things that are sort of working. There are things that are not working. And you know, I think the reason I get twitchy when people say green jobs is because I worry, oh my gosh, did we take anything away from the experience we had previously? So how can we play a role in sort of sharing insights, lifting up what we think are promising practices with our partners who are doing the work on the ground and then helping translate that to a policy audience or to, you know, business leaders. I think that's where JP Morgan has played and where we will continue to try to play. Yeah, Jenny was working in the city of Philadelphia during the, during the first green jobs conversation. So she knows kind of the challenges of getting ahead of the market. But I think that we're all in agreement that the market is completely different now in terms of where the demand is. The question is, can you drive a demand and can you drive resources to the better jobs in the context of some of that demand as we're trying to build out that part of a, a new segment of our economy? And since we have Philadelphia on the line just now, um, school construction and modernization dollars are, will go a really long way, not only for green jobs, but energy efficiency and also equipping kids with the right right the right equipment actually for um, some of the green jobs to come. Um, mm -hmm. Really good example is uh, the Harbor School in New York. I mean, it's not necessarily school construction and modernization, but these kids are learning 
um, navigational skills, uh, uh, like, like, like river navigation skills, uh, oyster cultivation, a host of other pieces that are related to uh, kind of um, climate mitigation, right? Um, there's, there's a number of other schools, Toledo Technology Academy, um, that does a, a number of, a, a lot of work around um, EV manufacturing and, and the manufacturing sector. Um, but so, so the school, the schools have to be kind of modernized in a way that matches the labor market trends. So I, you know, that's, I just wanted to kind of put that out there really quickly. Absolutely. Jihang, let me turn to you. So uh, obviously, you know, we've talked about the expectations that were raised around free community college by the administration, you know, and just last month when, um, when President Biden was being asked during his news conference about kind of like what, are, what were his two of his biggest priorities about things that may be left out of the Build Back Better package, free community college was one of them along with the child tax credit. And so I think this raises the question of both, you know, we have things now that are available to help community colleges fulfill some of the role that you've described and other folks have looked it up, but then we have this other question about where is this conversation about expanding assets to community college probably going to head into the future? So I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that, whether it's happening in the context of Build Back Better or some other ways where we can get Congress to make to take some actions to make it easier for folks to get on to a community college campus. Well, Andy, as you know, one of our top priorities as an association is short-term Pell. Um, uh, on uh, uh, earlier this month, uh, Representative Levin was able to introduce an amendment uh, that was added onto the Competes Act that provided short-term Pell. We're excited about that opportunity uh, for our bipartisan agreement on uh, the Competes Act. We do believe uh, short-term Pell is a, um, a one solution. It is not the solution. Uh, we still need to provide uh, basic supports uh, to students while they go through college and even for sh these short-term programs. Uh, one of the legacies of the TACT program that we learned about after the fact is that many students that uh, the TACT funds really supported our infrastructure within our institutions, but without the critical resources to support our students through, uh, through tuition waivers, through basic need support, um, it, could, it didn't have the punch, so to speak, that we really wanted for our students. Uh, I will also acknowledge that the Department of Education uh, last month announced additional money for institutions that uh, needed some, uh, that had a need outside of the HERF funds, uh, and that those funds could be utilized for um, basic needs. Uh, I'm, I'm excited that the basic needs conversations have continued and uh, we as a society and, you know, as a community college leader, I would say we within this workforce community need to do a little bit better job of articulating that vision to, to our uh, other partners that, you know, we have an expectation that students have the critical needs and supports necessary to finish their education. Well, the flip side of that is if you're looking for a job and you're in job training, we probably as a society should be also thinking about all of these pieces too. Uh, child care to um, food insecurity to transportation. These are things that are covered by a Pell Grant. Just because you're a working single mom doesn't mean that and you're going through courses, uh, even from our community college to another training provider, that you don't have these needs too. So I think mm -hmm. these are things that we need to think about holistically, how we support these individuals uh, to ascend to the middle class. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and thanks Jihang for bringing up and Skill Summit attendees, you're going to hear more about this, uh, this recent win where proposals around short-term Pell and also about collecting the wage and employment outcomes of college graduates to have those two pieces of thing, those two pieces married together in an amendment that was adopted as part of the House America Competes Act, which just passed the House and now is gonna be heading over to the Senate. So there's gonna be a great opportunity for Skill Summit attendees to be weighing in on some of those discussions because uh, to Ji Hang's point, it's not the entirety of the solution, but it's certainly a part of the solution that's something that we could do right now to make it easier for folks to get onto a community college campus, get the skills that they need connected to a program that's connected to local industry in a way that they're gonna get a job and advance a career and get hopefully starting to get back to that building back better uh, goal that we're looking for so many people who have been impacted by this pandemic. Well, boy, I have other things I would love to talk to the four of you about, but we've come to the, we've come to the end of our time. So uh, I wanna thank Alex, Jenny, Ji Hang, and Derek for a great conversation. 
Uh, I want to make sure that folks know that the Joint Center, JP Morgan, ACCT, and Sierra Club, they're all doing work on these issues, and you should follow them and find out what they're doing in addition to finding out how it is that we're collaborating with them here at National Skills Coalition because they're really doing important work on, on all of the issues that we talked about today. So with that, I'm going to bring this uh, opening plenary of our Skills Summit to a close. Again, thank you all. I just want to remind folks that this session is also going to be posted on our Fireside Chats website, nationalskillsfiresidechats.com, so you'll be able to see it there as well. And reminder to all Skills Summit attendees, we'll see you back here later on this afternoon for more great content. Thanks, everyone.